great herbal day. This is Dr. Herb Sister, and so many of you showed up for the um, Womb Loveology certification in the last two years, two to three years, and we're starting a new class. I wanted to just have a little cup of tea and talk to you about how we're going to um, proceed with this and what it is and why it's something that you would really want to get involved in. First of all, as I said, let's just relax and I want to tell you a little bit about myself so you can understand how I've created these different um, systems of healing. Um, I am, you know, the, the, the big girl, the oldest girl in a family of um, six and I grew up in Flint, Michigan before the water crisis and my mom was a very proactive, very revolutionary woman for her time. And she used to have all of us sitting down around her and um, talking to us about the world, um, about what she was reading in the encyclopedias, because we had a set of encyclopedias, the only people in this whole big old, you know, area. And she was reading them from A all the way to Z. So of course we were too. And she would talk to us about, you know, different things in the world, um, our history, you know, um, our lives, our, one time she told us that, you know, Nat Turner was our cousin, you know, so those are the kind of conversations we were having, you know? Um, and so my mom, she came out of a family. Well, it was just her and her sister and her dad raised her because their mom, you know, left when she was 10 years old during that time. When she was growing up before the 50s, that was a big, you know, um, mark on your life is not to have your mom in the house. So she didn't have a lot of friends. She had one friend because other mothers wouldn't let her, their daughters be friends with her because she didn't have a mom at home. So she became very independent and very strong minded and very um not able to convince easily without true evidence, you know? So this is the kind of thing that she passed on to us and the whole thing about Nat Turner and the revolution and, um, how we were supposed to, um, think for ourselves. And, and even she even said things to us, like, if I die tomorrow, go to school the next day, you know? So she really wanted us to be strong and able to move forward in life. And, um, and of course that makes an impact on you. And, and because she was like that, we had a lot of bullying in our neighborhood because of course, you know, there was, there was no reason at that time, black people thought if you're smart and if you're educated and if you like to read and if you like to work with ideas that you think you're white. So we had a lot of bullying. And so we stayed kind of separate from the neighbors in, you know, in the, in the neighborhood. Well, that just makes you stronger, really, you know? So what I noticed, though, is um, my mom, she she went on like that as far as, you know, motivating us and telling us we you don't need them and go ahead and go to do your after school activities, read your books, go to the library, do all that. So we were always very independent. Well, my mom passed away when I was 17. Suddenly, you know, she was... A, you know, a round woman, what we, what we call thick now, you know, but she was round and she had diabetes and she didn't know it. So I ended up taking her to the doctor because it was November and it seemed like she had the flu in Michigan in November. If you're sick, the first thing people think is that you have the flu. So I took her to the doctor and the doctor said, oh, you just have the flu. Just go home and you'll be okay. Well, this was Monday. And then by Tuesday, she was like, you know, um, having delusions and, you know, and we just says, okay, well, you'll be okay. Cause you know, we want to take her to the doctor. And she says, you guys just want to tell me what to do. And of course, nobody wants to tell a strong woman, black woman, what to do. Right. You know, so you say, okay, you don't have to go to the hospital now. So the next morning I, we woke up and it was Wednesday and I was going to go to, that was my first semester at University of Michigan. I was on the way to school and I was just, you know, basically 
checking in with my baby sister who was two years old. Okay, uh, mama, here's, you know, Dana and I'm going to go to school. And then she didn't respond and she didn't respond and she didn't respond. And I couldn't wake her up. Da, da, da. Well, you know, but I called the ambulance. I took my baby sister next door to my auntie. You know, that's how it is in, in, in you know, certain neighborhoods. Families live in clusters. And and then I called my dad at work. He worked at, you know, Chevrolet Metal Fab. He worked in the shop, as we call it there. And they came, the ambulance came. My dad met him at the hospital. And the next thing I know, my dad was coming home with a, a brown bag, you know, with my mom's clothes in it, you know, her gown and stuff with his sisters holding his arms and everything. And they were like coming up the walkway really slow. And when he came in the house and he says, mama died. And I just like, anybody want coffee? And I went straight in the kitchen and start, you know, moving, moving. And, and because, you know, that's how she kind of taught us. Keep going, do stuff, you know? Well, that in itself is devastating. I got a two year old sister and all of these siblings in between 10 and nine and, um, 15 and 14 and, you know, all of these people. Um, and I was the oldest. So, you know, you already went into, into action and just keeping the lessons that she had. And she was 35. She was 35. Big deal, you know? So what I recognize is that, you know, that life of having that type of, um, you just being thrown into being an adult, you know, although she had always trained us, you know, how to cook, how to do this, how to do that. And if I'm not here, you do this. So all of that is part of, you know, um, your resolve, part of your mindset on, I can make things work. I can do things, you know? So I, um, you know, that was a big deal for the family. You never recover from your mother passing away, period. Okay, so, but what I recognized is my mom was unmothered. I was unmothered. And I created, you know, um, womb loveology, which is the art, science, and practice of loving and healing our wombs. And womb loveology, it examines herstical historical perspectives of women's womb stories. And that is part of my womb story, even though I did not realize it, you know, when I first started talking about womb stories, that is my part of my womb story. Um, and what that does is that your mom is your anchor. Your mom is the person who teaches you how to be a woman. Your mom is the person who um, increases your power and empowers you to change and do things and all of that. Well, thank goddess that my mom did all of that as early and as continual as she could previous to me being 17. Because, you know, I still think, oh, what would my mom want? What, what would my mom expect? I mean, and we all do that. And sometimes you have mom stories that don't you do that. That's disrespectful. Ain't nobody going to want you like that. Da, da, da. I never heard that. I always heard you can do it. Go try it. You know, forget them. Ignore that. Da, 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 da. So I have the very strong attitude that you need to look at the facts, take out what is working for you. And ignore what is not working for you. You know, if it doesn't uplift you, ignore that. <laughs> you know, and I'm saying this because um, we're within womb loveology, which is the art, science, and practice of loving and healing our wombs. One of the things that is part of our historical record, part of our collective womb story is that we have a very strong idea and mindset of paternalism and paternalism is when society has decided that men have better ideas and they are in 
control of women. And whatever they say goes, women are their helper. Women are there to promote and push and provide them with the support they need to do whatever they want, even if it's against you, you know? And of course, at a particular time in our history, that was common. You know, women sacrificed their entire being to make sure that their men, brothers, dads, uncles, cousins, males, all were able to have and do and be as much as they needed with all the support that they needed. I had one, you know, just a mindset just came to me. I had one girl told me her aunt told her, um, and I guess they either came up from the islands and her aunt told her for her to look out for her cousin. Her cousin was male, of course. And she was like 24 and he was like 37. And, she, and her aunt told her to look out for him, you know, and to see what he needed and to make sure check in on him and all this. And I'm like, he's supposed to be you the baby cousin. He's supposed to be checking in on you. But she was committed to it because that was the way she was raised, you know. Um, so what we do in womb loveology is is we examine this paternalistic society and how the patterns of paternalism have taught us how to think, how to be in our bodies, how to look at our wombs and our creativity and our ability to create and our cycles and our energy and all of that. Paternalism affects our mindsets about all of that because, you know, many of us know that, you know, there was traditions in which women were, during their cycle, were told, they weren't to cook. They weren't to, you know, be around other people. They were to kind of sequester themselves. And that's a, a traditional, um, and I'm saying traditional in the ways of third world where women go to a little hut and all of the women just bring them food and everything. And we've had quite a bit of that within the American, African-American society. So we have to look at the roots of paternalism and how it affects us as women and how we see ourselves as women. Because as women, I mean, part of that, we are the most powerful beings in the universe. We are. We keep everything going. We create societies, children, communities, businesses, families, we are the ones that hold it down. We are the ones that carve it out from nothing. And we take care of everybody and keep them alive. Even once they're supposed to be able to keep themselves alive, we still keep them alive. So it is our power that is really at issue. And we have taken our power as something that we need to tamp down, something that we need to hold down to make other people feel good and make them feel powerful and make them feel in charge. And really that's part of the reason why we're in the situation we in in the society is because the power of women, the creativity of women has not been fully utilized, acknowledged, accepted, and explored so that it can benefit everybody, including the woman. You know, so um, womb loveology, that's one of the first things that we do is to examine that. Well, some of the other um, things that we could, because really, guess what? It's the miseducation of the sisters, you know, and we're going to empower and reeducate the sisters. And that's how you get your power back. That's how you shift your energy from being, you know, an object to being a, um, a creator. And as a creator, you can do anything. You can create whatever you think, you know, rather than thinking you need permission. And that's so often what we have been taught is we need permission from our 
fathers, our mothers, our churches, our jobs, our spouses or partners that we need permission. We need no one's permission to be the powerful beings and to do what we're supposed to be doing. We know we, we don't need it. We have it. And we have to recognize and we have to be taught and we have to acknowledge those powers, superpowers and intuition, superpower. And a lot of times we have this intuition and we think, oh, you know what? I, I need to I need to check. Let me ask my friend. Let me ask a few people to see if this is really a good idea, if this makes sense. You know, I can see you having one friend, you know, that's like your your ride and die friend. You know, you could have one friend, but even if that, if she says, or he says, well, I don't know if that's going to be the best thing. You need to still go ahead and do it. Why? Because what is your life for? Your life is here to explore and to try out new things. So that's part of, you know, um, so we have been miseducated. So we're going to, within womb loveology, return ourselves, our mindset, our energy, our creative force into our rightful place. So womb loveology is a physical, nutritional, historical, emotional, and ideological opportunity for women to cre recreate themselves in their circle, in their world, and in, in their womb story. And, and, and helping other women, women to do the same thing, to recreate and heal their womb story. And, and as I think about it, you know, and, you know, I'm hesitating. Why? Because as I think about it, sometimes when your mother passes away, when you're a young girl, when you need her, that is a very challenging healing to take place. And I think on some level, that's one of the reasons why I have taken on the job, the mission of healing and empowering women, because I recognize that not having someone who is empowering to you and helping you to challenge your, your mindsets and some of the ideas that are destructive to your, your creative center and destructive to your your life and your energy and your purpose, having that is the best thing you can have is to have somebody stand with you. Look at my shirt. I got on here what I have on. I stand with black women. You know, that's the truth. I stand with black women. That's why I do what I do. So womb loveology is a belief system that is going to help to change women and how they approach their life and how they approach their healing and how they help other women to be healed, you know, empower other women to be healed, you know, because most of the time people who come to me, they are unmothered. I, you know, they sometimes don't realize it because sometimes your mother can be on the planet, but not be able to do and give you what you need, you know? Um, and that's why we circle as women, because you have a circle of mothers when you have women of all different ages and, um, ideas within your circle, you get something from everybody, you know, and, and that's a benefit to, to all of us, you know, um, so we believe within the womb loveology course that is going to be starting. And you could also take it um, on your own as far as, you know, self-directed. One of the things we talk about the history of paternalism so that we can get an idea of where these, some of this stuff is coming from. You know, uh, we talk, we make sure that we understand our anatomy particularly our female anatomy, because a lot of women, they go to the doctor and some of the things they're being told, if they just knew how the body worked, they would question that immediately. Like, what the heck? What is that? That's, is that true? 
No, that's not true. I mean, some of this stuff, you don't have to have a PhD or an MD. You can have common sense and know some of this stuff is not true or is not relevant to what's going on with you. That's empowering to be able to ask questions and have an understanding of what's going on. It's like if somebody, if you went to have your car taken care of and they told you, oh, well, you know what? Your back seat is loose. You're like, what the back seat got to do with my car turning on? You know that, <laughs> you know? So that's some of the things that, you know, is necessary for us to understand the anatomy. So um, we also will go over the emotional aspect. Now, there's a, there's a sincere emotional aspect to, to women and their bodies. I mean, when you tell somebody you make, you get on my nerves, you make my stomach hurt, I, truly your body hears that and your body recognizes that, you know, and if I even said right now, think of lemons, 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 all of us would have to swallow extra because lemons make, you, you know, these little glands start skeeting out saliva and even if you don't smell them or see them, thinking of it would create an emotional response that gives you a physical response. And so same thing happens when you have a lot of emotion around things in your life. I mean, you know, if you hate your mama, a lot of women do, that's a big deal. You hate your spouse, your husband, you hate where you live, you hate your job. Your kids get on your nerves. All of those things affect your physical self, affect your mental self, affect your womb, you know? Um, so we're going to be looking at, at all of that. Um, we're going to look at nutrition because, you know, many of us, we... We, we have sometimes in our families, you said, well, everybody in my family has fibroids. Well, everybody in your family eats together and they learn how to eat together, you know, and y'all cook the same and all of that because you have a taste that's in that family for how things should work, how things should taste, you know. So we will be um, looking at those types of things and you will have a, uh, a womb love journal that will help you that has a lot of different things in it that will help you identify what's going on in your your life what has gone on in your life um how our class is going to work is that that journal is something that you're going to be working on every day you know um and that emotional aspect is something that is key because if you don't if you don't recognize where it's coming from. If you don't tell yourself the truth, how can you heal? How can you help other, other sisters to heal? It's, it's, it's a, it's not, it's not possible. You know, I've seen women who are, are out in the social milieu attempting to help women to heal when they haven't healed yet. And you can tell by their anger issues and the way they approach people and, and their attitude and their energy. And there's a lot of women out there thinking that they're doing something to help and they aren't, they aren't free yet. You know, they aren't free. So, um, and I was going to say, you know, there is a profile that I have devised over many years of working with women in womb issues. And the profile is pretty profound and um and and some of the profile is that you know that anger issue is key it's key that you have the anger the procrastination is another key issue the um looking for permission is another key angle the you know um Going to do it next week or going to do it tomorrow, which is the procrastination thing. Very, very significant in women who have womb issues. In waiting for one solution. No, it's, the, it's not one solution. Everything is a combination of different 
ideas and solutions and it's multifaceted you know it's multifaceted so all of this is part of what we're going to be working with in the womb loveology we're also going to be working with science and one of the things within science is the endocrine disrupting hormones which comes from our environment and is disrupting women's ability to get pregnant, their fertility, the fact that they have fibroids and cysts and all of these other womb issues, uh, PCOS. This will help you heal yourself and it will help you to empower others. You know, um, so we're going to have seven sessions and I'm flexible. That's the thing. That's the thing. That's one of the things in the profile is not being flexible. <laughs> I'm flexible. Um, the classes will be on Thursday nights. Um, they will be pre recorded. So if you miss, you can listen to it later. Um, and you will have a workbook that's part of your, your, um, your investment in yourself, in your womb story. And this is going to be something that you have not thought was affecting you. And that was part of what was holding your healing back and was part of you not understanding why you have these different ideas about yourself, no matter how hard you try, no matter how hard you work on yourself, no matter how many books and pounds and things that you do you still have certain ideas and th that's why this is going to be so profound for you because when you have something that is helping you to change some of the fundamental issues that you've been dealing with forever it changes everything in your life it changes everything in your life and the womb loveology, which is the art, science, philosophy of loving and healing our wombs, is one of those things that will change your life. I'm going to be teaching the class live this time, but as t you know, I will next time probably not. So if you want to have that opportunity to interact and ask questions and have, you know, these profound discussions. This is an opportunity for you to do that. So womb loveology, the art, science, herstory of loving and healing our wombs is a profound part of who you are that is undiscovered. And that undiscovered part is a key that you're missing. So if you do the Womb Loveology certification course, you will forever be grateful to yourself for listening to that intuition, that deep inner voice that tells you what to do, that so often you've ignored. And ignoring that voice is really the power that you have. So do not ignore that voice. Do not ignore your power. Do not ignore yourself. I'm Dr. Herb Sister, and thank you for listening to this, and thank you for being a part of my womb story. And I look to be speaking with you and talking with you and engaging with you and working with you in the Womb Loveology Certification Course. One more thing I want to tell you is, you know, I love languages and ovario means ovaries in Spanish, but I've repurposed it. And in our courses, we say ovario to say hi, to say bye, to say congratulations, to say you go, to say yay, you know, so... When you come into the course, you come in and you say, Ovario, oh, and everybody goes, Ovario, oh, Ovario. Oh, we love saying it, you know. So I'm going to say, Ovario, oh, 
I look to see you. I look to hear you. I look to work with you. I look to empower you. I look to walk with you on this journey for the womb loveology certification course, the, the art science practice history of loving and healing our wombs. I'll talk to you soon. Have a great herbal day and ovario. Oh, <laughs>